you. Uh, I've had a very nice relationship with Speaker's uh, Spotlight and uh, a good firm to work with, and thank you all for being here this morning. Because this is a small group, I'm going to do this very informally, no notes and no uh, PowerPoints and things like that. Just going to talk as if this was a conversation. Um, you may have seen the article a couple of days ago. It was in Monday's newspapers. It was uh, Jack Jawab, who teaches down at Concordia, um, is the head of something called the Association of Canadian Studies. And they did a survey, and they asked Canadians for uh, what they were most proud of about their country. Now, at the very bottom, I was extremely pleased to see as a Republican was the monarchy. And at the very top, at 95%, was universal health care. Now, in the book, I looked at a lot of public opinion data. And if you ask Canadians what is the most important symbol in the country, they don't say uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, they don't say Parliament, they don't say uh, multiculturalism, the RCMP, the CBC, they say health care. And this is very weird if you think about it. If you ask a, a Frenchman what makes you French, they will say la langue française, la civilisation française, if you ask a Brit, they might say the National Health Service, but they'd also say Shakespeare and uh, Churchill and the Battle of Britain and so on, Trafalgar, whatever. If you asked a German, they'd say Goethe, Schilling, uh, Beethoven. If you ask our French-speaking fellow citizens, they would say, bah, c'est la civilisation française, le fait que notre noyau de la civilisation s'est installé au bord de la Saint-Laurent il y a 400 ans. On a survécu, on est toujours ici, on est en plein éclaircissement. We're the only people in the world who define ourselves by healthcare. And that is very weird. And it also makes a debate, a discussion even about healthcare difficult. Because we've made it existential, we've made it who we are. So it's not like some program that you can discuss in a more rational way. In English-speaking Canada, it's, it's an icon. It's who we are. And that's why political people, for a long time, in my long experience, uh, it goes back 40 years almost, have been quite afraid to talk about this issue in a straightforward way. What usually happens in an election campaign is one party says, I will spend more than the other party to reaffirm and show you my commitment to health care is greater than theirs. And there's no serious debate about whether the system is good, whether it should be changed. One of the other reasons why we have trouble talking about it is because anytime somebody says, you know, maybe this system isn't as good as it should be, and maybe we should re-examine some fundamental parts of it, you're immediately accused of wanting US-style medicine. And there's nothing that makes a Canadian's moral superiority beat more strongly than thinking that we're better than the Americans. Now, I don't want US-style medicine. It has its strengths, and we can learn things from that. But they spend 17.6% of their GNP on health care, and we spend 11.7%. So they're spending 50% more of their national income on health care, and they're not getting 50% better aggregate health care outcomes. So you'd have to be a bit screwy to junk this system and buy it into theirs. But the defenders of the status quo of our system, who've dominated the debate for a long time, are always making Canadian-American comparisons, always to the honor and strength of Canada. And the subtext is that if you open up a debate, you've got some kind of hidden agenda to bring US-style private two-tier medicine to Canada. I like to tell audiences, you know, Jean Chrétien, who was great at things like this, used to say, down there, they check your wallet before your pulse, and everybody gets pretty nervous, right? Because it confirms the prejudices that we have. So the first thing to do is to banish the U.S. comparison. Just forget that because it's not relevant. We're not going to have their system, and forget it. It's a bogeyman. So then you say to yourself, well, in business, as you know, this is share up here, okay? As business, in business, uh, you have to benchmark yourself all the time. How are we doing? against our competitors. So you should do that in public life too. How are we doing? So this is something that Canadians don't usually do because the only benchmark we have is the United States. But the only fair benchmark is to compare how we're doing with the other countries that have largely public health care systems, which is what I did. That's an apple and an apple comparison. And when you do that, here's what you find, unfortunately. 
On the one hand, you find, again, put, put the U.S., they, they're, they're such an outlier in everything in this field that it's not really relevant. So if you look at who's spending, we're in the top five on spending as a share of our total economy on a per capita basis. We're up there with Germany and Denmark and Switzerland and France. So we're up there as big spenders. And that's not a bad thing. Rich countries always spend more than poorer countries on health care, and why shouldn't we? We're rich. We can spend money. So that's not the problem. The problem is when you look at the outcomes, like how, how are we doing for all this money, those other countries in the top five, they show top five results. We show middle of the pack at best results. Now this isn't what Canadians want to hear. Most political people in my experience want to say and always do say we have the best healthcare system <coughs> in the world. And Canadians want to hear that, desperately want to hear that. Unfortunately, there, and Mr. Romano, when he did his commission a decade ago, said it and said it repeatedly in public presentations. And audiences love to hear it. The fact, painful fact is, folks, it isn't true. Our system is middle of the pack. Now, I didn't bring along because I didn't want to bore you, but there's a lot of material on this.